this uh, plenary session with Susan Bernardin. I'm so happy to be sitting here with her because uh, I've been wanting to sit her for a while for these three days and I had no time. So even if this is not like the best to chat situation, we're having an hour together. We Which do. is good. We will always have today. <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay. So uh, let me introduce you to Susan Bernardin. Uh, a lot of you uh, know her, but uh, I'm going to tell you that she's a director of the School of Language, Culture, and Society at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. She's a specialist in Indigenous Literary and Visual Studies, as well as Gender and the American West. And she has published widely on foundational and contemporary Native authors as well as indigenous mixed media, visual arts, and comics. She's a co-author of Trading Aces, European, Euro-American Photographers and Native North Americans. She also facilitated a new edition of In the Land of the Grasshopper Song by Bison Books in collaboration with Karuk tribal members, Terry Subahan and Andre Kramlit. Is that okay? She was, uh, she is a former president of the Western Literature Association, She's a two-time recipient of its uh, Walker Award for Best Published Essay in the field of American, Western American Studies. She was also a 2016 recipient of the Beatrice, Beatrice Medicine Award given by the Association for the Study of American Indian Literatures for her essay, A Corn, a corn Soup is Good Food. Um, I'm sorry, I've got a problem with long and short distance uh, visions. <laughs> okay. And uh, she serves as guest editor of the 2014 Special Issue of Western American Literature entitled Indigenous West, Literary and Visual Aesthetics. And most recently, she edited this great book, Gender and the American West, just this year, part of Rowledge uh, Gender Companion series. And I'm very happy to be in this book too. So um, please, let's um, hear, let's listen to Susan Bernardi, who is talking to us about um, a great title, Remembering Into the Future, Gender and the American West. So Susan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I have such gratitude to be here, and I want to extend my gratitude to the organizers of this amazing conference. Thank you so much to David, to Angel, to Amaya, to all the work um, having done one of these. I know how much it takes, all the little details, the big details, and it is truly amazing to be in an in-person conference after so many difficult times that we've all had. So just know that although my jet lag has been really bad on this trip, so if I like start dozing off when I'm talking, you'll know why. I've really appreciated being here, so thank you so much. So driving from Bilbao on Sunday, I marveled at the affinity between the beautiful green mountains in this vast country with that of my adopted state of Oregon. Here's a photo I took near the peak of Mary's Peak, which is the highest point in the coastal range of Western Oregon. On a clear day, one without smoke from wildfires, you can see up the volcanic range of the Cascade Mountains to the east and across the coastal range, the distant shimmer of the Pacific Ocean, one hour drive to the west. Mary's Peak is the local landmark where I live in Corvallis, Oregon. Its vantage point anchors an essential message of my talk today. We are always in motion even when we feel things are not changing. This is a talk in four parts. I begin in Oregon, the geographical, environmental, political, and social location for my most recent work, which was imagining, co-creating, and editing a 34-chapter volume entitled Gender in the American West, part of Rutledge's Gender Companion series. This book includes chapters by conference participants Nancy Cook, Bill Hanley, Amaya, I'm so sorry, and Kalenda Eden, I can't do the R's, who unfortunately could not join us here this week. Other important places and communities in the U.S. West ground my thinking, most notably long-term research on the white women who lived and worked in the late 19th and early 20th century in Northwestern California homelands, Dakota, Yurok, Hoopa, and Weot peoples. 
I then share the broad questions and challenges about the relationship between gender, the American West, and US Western studies that I brought to this project. Here I talk about the American West as both conceptual framework and critical problem, as both impossibility and possibility. In part three, I describe the volume's conception, format, and collaborative composition as modeling a feminist practice of intellectual engagement across difference. Finally, I highlight insights I've especially learned during this project and from this project, offering brief descriptions of two contributor chapters to suggest future directions for the West, uh, with the hope that there may be a future. So part one. Living and working in Oregon during the inception and composition of Gender in the American West deeply informed the book. As I was thinking about this talk a month ago, smoky, ashy air and gray sky catapulted me back to the catastrophic wildfires that devastated Oregon in fall 2020. My drives across the state border to California this year in the past several years have borne witness to numerous major fires while they were happening, as well as their stark, sobering afterlives manifest on the land. Climate change is viscerally felt in Oregon. As I look at the miles of heat wave blighted Douglas firs on our drives through the mountains, I see the precarity and preciousness of this place I call home. As we move anxiously into our uncertain futures, the violences of the past interrupt the present, underscoring that the past tense of the West is our felt, though not equally so, present. Yet despite the Oregon Trail, the state of Oregon does not loom large in conversations about the American West. It should. Sandwiched between California and Washington, it has not tended to garner much national attention either. Two notable exceptions, which highlight the color-coded divide you see between Republican red and Democrat voting blue regions in the state, was the 41-day white militia occupation of the Meller National Refuge in rural north, uh, no, south, south, not north, southeastern Oregon in winter 2016 and the multiracial Black Lives Matter protests in Portland and Northwestern Oregon in 2020 and 2021. In the former, the armed occupation of a federally managed wildlife refuge, which in turn occupies land once held by Northern Paiutes, who now are on a very tiny reservation nearby, ended with seven defendants fully acquitted of charges a few weeks before the presidential election in 2016. After the attempted coup of January 6, 2021, Jennifer Rocala, executive director of the Center for Western Priorities, called the 2016 refuge occupation, quote, a dress rehearsal for what we saw at the Capitol. You can draw a straight line from the Mallow takeover to the Trump insurrection in Washington. In May 2020, following a white police officer's public killing of a black man named George Floyd in Minneapolis, Downtown Portland, Oregon was convulsed by months of Black Lives Matter protests, protests violently suppressed by federal officers sent by Donald Trump. Images of lawless Portland proliferated on Fox Media News networks. Networks of white supremacists in the Pacific Northwest converged on Portland and Salem, which is the state's capital. These emboldened displays of white supremacy and toxic white masculinity are not new. They are in fact baked into the very origins of the state and its ongoing histories. Um, you see this a lot in Oregon. <laughs> so I, I was laughing at the move, the, the Polish uh, sausage wards or whatever that's happening. It was hilarious, but <laughs> it's the other side. Anyway, I, I digress. I'm always mad when I'm driving. Like what, what, no, 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 okay. Sorry. Ugh. Oregon's founding constitution was explicitly premised on creating a so-called white utopia and legally barred black people from entering or living in the state. And it was kind of repealed in 1925, kind of. Years before Oregon statehood in 1859, the United States Congress passed the Oregon Donation Land Act. We donate the land in which white American men already living in Oregon territory could claim 320 acres of land for themselves and another 320 acres in the name of their wives. 
Settlers who moved later could claim half as much. Western historian Peter Bogue notes that this double allowance of land, quote, encouraged marriage in early Oregon and that the, quote, extraordinarily large land grants available through the Donation Land Act privileged male-female couples in mid-19th century Oregon. Queer ecology scholar Catriona Sandilands has similarly noticed, excuse me, similarly noted that, quote, because of the comparatively large size of these allotments and the popularity of the program, not only did the Donation Land Act encourage heterosexual marriage along the settlement of the West, it imposed a monolithic culture of single heterosexual family sized lots on the land with significant effects on the economic and environmental history of the region from nuclear family farming patterns, the inhibition of town development, and even increased forestation. At the national level, the Homestead Act of 1862 similarly distributed expropriated indigenous homelands to white settlers a move that Western historian Margaret D. Jacobs described as, quote, gendered engineering to promote the settlement of white families in the West. As Bill Hanley puts it, the romanticized heterosexual gender binary has always been central to the frontier imaginary, serving to justify and motivate conquest. Gender, sexual, and racial ideologies literally made the American West that we know today possible. We cannot separate one from the other. And if we had any doubt about their continued salience, just think of Jeff Bezos adorned in a spacesuit, cowboy boots, and cowboy hat as he launched his rocket in summer of 2021. <laughs> oh, goodness. Armed white people protesting their land rights loomed ironic for indigenous peoples who have called Oregon home since time immemorial. This is not limited to Oregon. On a recent episode of the best current TV series in the world, Reservation Dogs, set in Muscogee Seminole communities in Oklahoma, one of the main teen characters, Bear, has this, I just did a screenshot off the TV last week, has this poster in his room. Uh, my home institution, Oregon State University, is Oregon's land grant institution, made possible by the 1862 Morale Act and established from the sale of expropriated indigenous lands in Southern Oregon. Our main campus is located on Kalapuya Ilihi, Kalapuyan land, homelands, and one hour from the two reservations where descendants of the peoples forcibly removed from Corvallis live. Um, and I'm director of indigenous studies as well, in part of my job. I also live 45 minutes from Chamawa Indian School one of the few remaining uh, Indian boarding schools in the United States, it, it's still run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Last fall on Indigenous Peoples Day, known elsewhere as Columbus Day, researchers Sue Ann Reddick and Eva Gugamos made public the names of students who died at the school between 1880 and 1945. About 270 students died while in custody there. Um, and 175 are buried in the school cemetery, and then there's a, they don't know where other children are. Um, I wanted to include this piece by um, Kyla Farrell Smith, who's Klamath, um, and this is in the Portland Art Museum. It's, a, it's an extraordinary piece. Um, cut hair is a sign of mourning and grief, but it was, it was also what was done to Native children as soon as they entered right. It, um, and then the red, yeah, so it's, it's mourning for that. And red also is significant for missing and murdered indigenous women. Chamawa was the boarding school that was attended by foundational 20th century Salish Kootenai and Montana author Darcy McNichol and recounted in his short story, Train Time. In August, Secretary of the T Interior, Deb Holland, the first native woman to serve in the cabinet and from Laguna Pueblo tweeted, Federal Indian boarding school policies have touched every indigenous person I know. Some are survivors, some are descendants, but we all carry the trauma in our hearts. Boarding schools and the intergenerational trauma they have caused exemplify the weight of a past that can never stay put in the past. In the United States and Canada, indigenous children were forced to conform to the gender binary and to gender hierarchy. 
Gender violence in all of its forms has been the beating heart of settler colonialism, giving rise to native women's literature in the U.S. West, Sarah Winnemucca, Zikala Shah, Ruth Muskrat Brunson, Morning Dove. Two weeks after George Floyd's murder on June 13, 2020, anonymous activists at the University of Oregon toppled two iconic sculptures, the pioneer and the pioneer mother, that would be the mother, both located in the central part of campus. For many years, indigenous students and faculty had called for their removal, noting that the statues glorified the genocidal violence of Oregon pioneers and across the state. In the introduction to gender in the American West, I begin with this image. Situating it as part of a gendered history of settler colonialism and white women's complicity in its structural and systemic violences, including in making the Indian boarding schools run. They made the show work. The pioneer mother was uh, um, dedicated in 1932, 13 years after the whip and gun wielding male pioneer uh, was erected and one of hundreds of pioneer mother monuments erected across the American West in the early decades of the 20th century. The long suffering, morally virtuous and resilient pioneer mother has long been a cultural icon in the United States, perhaps reaching its biggest audience with a wildly successful, what is it? Bing, 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 bing of the 1970s and 80s and whose popularity was global, including C. As Amaya recounts in her wonderful essay for the volume, the pioneer mother's fall from her perch speaks not just to national reckonings over monuments to white supremacy and conquest in the United States, but also to long needed necessary moves in the field of Western US women's history. For reckonings to work, engagement with the past must be ongoing, in conversation with the differentiated realities we live today, and the alternative futures we want to bring into being. In this respect, monuments are never just about a selective memorializing of the past. They actively work to shape imaginations of our future. Part two. Over 25 years ago, I found myself asking a question I'm still asking. How to make sense of, how to draw meaning from the complex histories of white women who found measures of personal and professional fulfillment working in tribal communities in Northwestern California at the turn into the 20th century. Their professional opportunities and freedoms out West were made possible by the oppression, dispossession, and elimination of indigenous peoples, their sovereignty, their lands, their children. Dissertation research on the field matron system, a federal government program that placed white middle-class women and a few select native women, uh, boarding school educated, on reservations as, quote, domestic civilizers in the first two decades of the 20th century led me to the book In the Land of the Grasshopper Song, which was self-published in 1957. An astonishing hybrid text, Grasshopper Song is part travelogue, part ethnography, part frontier Bildungsroman, part feminist Western. Mary Arnold and Mabel Reed's two-year sojourn in 1908 and 1909 at the Salmon and Klamath Rivers furnished the materials for the book they eventually produced of their experiences as field matrons in the Kutuk tribal homelands. It's a wildly unconventional account of reverse assimilation. It exuberantly navigates gender roles and norms to their advantage even as they work to redress in some ways the post-apocalyptic circumstances faced by indigenous peoples a half century after California statehood. The afterlives of this book's publication continue to surprise me as is widely perceived as a Kutuk book full of stories, chisme, gossip or tea, and valued cultural information that are treasured by tribal members and descendants today. Um, and then uh, I've been visiting off and on for decades and that photograph is from um, Marlette Grant Jackson, whose family members are featured in the book. And um, she, this is a family photograph that she's just had. And she's like, I think it's them. I think it's the, I think it's the ladies. So there's this real engagement with, with the women and with the stories, um, which is just, 
it's it's really interesting. <clears throat> Arnold and Reed's relationships with Kuduk people are not easily categorized or codified even as they participated in and perpetuated systems of colonial violence by their very presence and position. Since the first of many visits to this place, I've moved between two seemingly irreconcilable fields, Western American studies and indigenous studies. My ongoing efforts to find a shared or common lexicon across what Nancy Cook yesterday called siloed forms of knowledge or deep divides across disciplines that focus on the same places and histories underlines the making of gender in the American West. As a field, Western American studies has been admittedly slow to rethink its dependence on frameworks that privilege particular kinds of chronologies, periods, and thematic approaches. For example, US Western historical scholarship has tended to focus exclusively on white women either equating women with whiteness or using gender as a cinnamon, 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 I like that, for women heteronormatively defined. In 1993, U.S. Western historian Susan Johnson observed that, quote, the field of Western women's history has developed with Western history as usual as its reference point, deriving part of what le legitimacy it has achieved from its oppositional relation to the presumed white male subject of the history of the American West. Tejana feminist historian Antonia E. Castaneda's foundational 1992 article, Women of Color and the Rewriting of Western History, The Discourse, Politics, and Decolonization of History, argues that, quote, historians, including feminist historians and other feminist scholars, must examine their assumptions as well as their racial class and gender positions as they redefine historical and other categories of analysis. The structures of colonialism are the historical legacy of the United States and as such inform the profession of history and the production of historical scholarship as much as they do any other human relationship and endeavor. If Western history is to be decolonized, historians must be conscious of their power and ideology within the structures of colonialism and conscious as well of the ways in which historical scholarship has helped to sustain and reproduce those structures. Yet even as scholars from a range of fields have worked to unsettle geographical, regional, and geopolitical definitions of the American West, its cultural power and political capital telegraph ongoing symbolic and structural violence that has hampered interdisciplinary conversations. Our methodologies have not always helped. Temporal, chronological, and regional approaches have tended to reaffirm structures of knowing invested in particular centers and orientations. Historian Karen J. Long put diplomatically when she observed that, quote, scholars whose work focuses on the U.S. West as a geopolitical location and historical process may see their work as ideologically distinct from, quote, the history of the American West. Indeed, some scholars explicitly refuse to participate in this project because the very word West was a barrier to their participation. For these scholars, West was felt as a wound as well as a word. Years ago, when I was co-president of the Western Literature Association with your friend David Fenimore, we notified Choctaw writer Leanne Howe that she was receiving the association's Distinguished Achievement Award. E yet, even though she had written a novel set in Indian territory and other work deeply resonant in the field, she openly hesitated. When I asked about her hesitation, she asked, is it gonna be a bunch of cowboy poets? Would I feel welcome there? And she was only half joking. She did come. It thus seemed an impossible task to conjoin gender in the American West is to immediately invite questions. Who's West? Which West? Where West? When West? Who's the we in West? Such a four letter word. What is its use value? Its definitional claims, its relevance or mattering as a category or conceptual framework to diverse fields that cross the region we like to call the American West. Not just for the past, but for imagining different presents and futures. And what about all the unspoken words that must be gathered in when we pair the words gender and West? Where do the always interrelational markers of identity, power, and difference come into play? Of sexuality, race, location, class, and on. As a feminist, have you ever seen these? These are like the robots run our campus now. This happened during the pandemic, we got taken over. They keep multiplying, it's like a Star Trek episode. 
They're very cute, though. But I digress. As a feminist and decolonial project, it had to proceed otherwise. Or as feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed says in a different but resonating context, quote, it is an ongoing unfinished project because it is a question how to build a feminist world when the world we oppose is the world we still inhabit. Part three, gender in the American West became a sustained thought experiment on this oh so impossible yet seemingly imperative placeholder. The uncertainty of the future given the convulsions of 2020 and 2021 gave added urgency to our project. The volume's creation spanned the last two years of the Trump regime and its agonizing endgame. It's not really over, though, is it? At every turn, we were reminded of the need for this book. This era of atrocities at the U.S.-Mexico border, separation of children from their families, religious and racialized immigrant bans, anti-Asian violence, open glorification of white supremacy, anti-blackness, and of course, truly horrific politicization of the pandemic in uh, the United States, affirmed core connections between the here and now and the then, then and there threading our chapters. As we individually and collectively reeled from the pandemic and from the daily assaults of Donald Trump, we witnessed how his administration weaponized and wreaked habit with some of our most fraught Western locations and metaphors. Election season rallies July 4th at Mount Rushmore, in Tulsa, June 20th, 2020, moved a day after the actual anniversary of one of the worst race massacres of black people in the United States, and the 2020 State of the Union address that Neil Campbell referenced earlier in this conference in which Trump extolled, quote, our ancestors who braved the unknown, tamed the wilderness, settled the wild west. As we alternately wrestled with, recovered, refused, or reframed the American West through gender, and its cat interracial cat categories, including race, ethnicity, sexuality, class, and nationality, the staying power of the West came to the fore, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Across the volume, essays address recent and ongoing horrors, such as the 2019 mass shooting in El Paso, the U.S. treatment of immigrants at the Mexican border, uh, anti-Asian violence, and the pandemic. Yet through intersectional and interdisciplinary frameworks, we also found common ground in how bodies, communities, and lands in the American West have variously witnessed and withstood the settler state, focusing on foundational acts of territorial and sexual violence in their afterlives. Our contributors highlighted key, highlighted key moments in the occupation and consolidation of lands at different eras of settler expansion, moving across many territories in and outside state and national borders we noted the interplay of territorial and gender violence, of dispossession and exclusion, of heteronormative power and the violence of belonging. That's fine Wander's words. We found unexpected connections across archives of knowledge, witness, and resistance, from reading between the lines of testimonials and recovering vernacular and print stories to unsettling California mission records and documenting that state's genocidal campaigns. We surfaced our alternative archives that affirmed resistance and survival, belonging and resilience. We found ourselves in fact to be living histories and living our histories. And we did so through a community of scholars from many vantage points within Western American studies and from fields that are often not in direct conversation with it, such as indigenous studies, queer indigenous studies, queer Latinx studies, Asian American studies, African American studies, and so on. Our thought experiment encompassed the format of the book, contributors' roles in shaping the book, and the knowledges, histories, and ways of seeing we centered throughout. Across diverse divergent methodologies, contributors forged relationships between gender and genre, considering visual art, film, memoir, popular culture, literature, laws. They stretched centuries and languages, disrupt, disrupted the familiar tropes, and offered new ways of thinking about place and performance, law and legacy. Instead of by region, period, or genre, gender in the American West is organized by four key, oops, by four key concepts, genealogies, bodies, movements, and lands. And then we realized we actually had a fifth one, archives. In an effort to decenter the composition process, I asked each contributor to choose which keyword they wanted their essay in. 
The essays, of course, move across categories, inviting relational readings across methodologies, fields, and situated knowledges. As such, the format is designed to highlight the productive messiness of thinking across in these various, way, various ways, across vocabularies, positionalities, vantage points. Although each essay stands alone, the essays work in relation. The sequencing in each section is intended to highlight juxtapositions, but also to instigate unexpected connections. And why those four keywords and not, other, not others? Good question. I could only choose four. <laughs> they serve as prompts and portals, engaging constitutive tensions of recovery and reframing new ways of seeing unexpected genealogies. The keyword bodies, for example, centers a core message of the book. Gender and sexual violence has driven US settler colonialism. Across difference, the essays in this section find common ground in embodied experiences to systems of power relations, social dynamics, gender roles, and land relations. Ryan Wander's essay, for example, invites relational readings through his analysis of how Asian immigrants and Asian North Americans have long provided key others against which normatively white North American genders and sexualities have gained shape and coherence, particularly as that shape and coherence emerge out of frontier tropes associated with the North American West. He considers the costs of racialized others belonging to the West, measuring what he calls overlapping but non-equivalent oppressions for people of color both in the late 19th century and now. Another pair of essays in this section reckon with the relationship between white masculinity and power in the Anthropocene Arriving at Joshua Anderson's words, the ways male fragility is camouflaged with fortitude and vulnerability is masked with violence. For Sylvan Goldberg, the Western's interest in extraction reveals the fragility rather than the strength of white male bodies, even as the genre so often refuses to recognize the future risk threaded into such a narrative. Bill Hanley highlights the allied and queer origins of the West while also considering how contemporary writers Emma Perez and Sebastian Barry query the Western with queer protagonists whose gendered and racial in-betweenness allows them to survive violence. That is a quote. Just as the format was intended to spark new ways of thinking about the relationship between gender and the American West, so too did my decision to highlight queer studies across multiple subfields. It was important to unpack, reframe, and decenter US West mythologies, yeah. notably their default heteronormativity. As Silvia Martinez Falquina, hope I got that right, noted on Monday, including Lisa Tatanetti's work, the West has always been queer. Moreover, the very term gender came under scrutiny as indigenous scholars such as Alicia Carroll just refused its use value entirely, citing it as a form of violence. Instead, Carroll pursued indigenous notions of gender as, quote, a complex that coheres land, body, spirit relations, and responsibilities. Part four, remembering into the future. As contributors rec variously reckon with, recover, reframe, and reimagine the past and present tenses of the American West, I want to highlight briefly the last two chapters of the book located in the section lands. The volume's final essays express to me a powerful message of futurity for the spaces currently called the American West. These two essays underscore for me why it's so important to center different knowledges, worldviews, embodied histories, and experiences in our studies of the American West. Because what do we make possible when we create spaces for sharing knowledge across difference? What new insights or ways of creating and being come into focus? In his essay, Eddie Alvarez Jr. details how Latinx art lays claim to histories and spaces of belonging in Los Angeles and broader US-Mexico borderlands through powerful mythologies, creating iconographies of inclusion instead of invisibility and marginalization. He provides an extended close reading of a 2011 pencil drawing by Hector Silva, a self-taught artist who was born in Guadalajara, Mexico, who later migrated to LA. His early career was drawing images of Hollywood icons, but then he moved on to explore a range of masculinities absent from popular media culture. As with much LA-based uh, Chicanx and Latinx art, Silva's drawings activate transformative iconographies of belonging. As a native Angelino, Alvarez finds particular kinship in Hector Silva's art, a kinship that refuses mythologies that have ill-served their communities, such as the ubiquitous mission myth in Southern California and Hollywood. 
Um, and there's like if you if you can see the details, um, there's the um, L.A. Dodgers. I just hate that team. Um, hat. Yes. Uh, hey, Ugh. Dodgers, the worst. And you can see Los Angeles City Hall, you know, kind of a phallic symbol in the middle. And in his essay, he really locates both um, the layered histories of that. Not only is, of course, the Dodgers are very very popular and beloved baseball team, of course, that, you know, connects people um, in Southern California. Um, but the stadium, um, in order to create that stadium, um, communities of color, especially um, Mexican, Mexican-American communities, um, were dispossessed of their homes, that those areas were raised to create the stadium. So there's layers of history and meaning embedded in these, um, in, in these, in these icons and that the city hall has also been a really important place for political activism um, for Latinx communities. So there's just one to highlight that there's a lot more going on too in this image. Alvarez brings welcome visibility to how queer Latinx artists are claiming and queering the urban Western borderlands while asserting that their West has always been queer. The final essay in Gender in the American West was the most expansive in unseating my own expectations for what an indigenous studies engagement with the American West could bring into being. We know that in stories of the American West, futures are foreclosed for indigenous people. It's all in the scripts after all. Uh, Lindsay Schneider, however, joins a growing number of indigenous scholars who instead insist on highlighting indigenous futures and in literature, film, and media arts of futurisms. Wait, did I just miss that? Okay. I'll try to hurry up with the time. Um, this has been a concept that I first heard in 2008 by um, a Klamath elder um, named um, Tom Ball. And he used the phrase remembering forward, imagining forward. And it's always sat with me. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a little bit about what indigenous futurity means, um, and I'd be happy to say more. It's, um, it's an orientation, it's an epistemology, and it's a value system in which past, present, and future are always in um, uh, active, in interactive engagement. Um, a very popular saying is the seventh generation thinking you're always making decisions based on your great, 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 right? You're always trying to think very long-term, which is very opposite mainstream American, you know, McDonald's, drive through I want it now, immediate gratification, et, et cetera. <clears throat> Indigenous futurity is action, it's a, pract it, it's a practice. Um, Laura Harjo has a, has a um, Muskogee or, or, or Creek um, scholar at the University of Oklahoma who does um, um, community planning. And her book, Spiral to the Stars, is one of the most amazing, exciting books I have read in years. It's extraordinary work. Uh, I just wanted to share a few ideas about how she uses indigenous futurity as a frame for her, for her book. She says, a focus on the future is to focus solely on a temporality to come. However, futurity means that we do not have to wait to see hopeful possibilities materialize in our community. Futurity is space, place, and temporality produced socially by people, including relatives located in the past, present, and future. It invokes many other temporalities, other spaces, and yet to be imagined possibilities. It's a practice of conceiving imaginaries. Indigenous futurity places us in conversation or in a dialectic with the unactivated possibilities of our past, present, and future relatives. These conversations include spaces and places that are rich with meaning and experience. She says, although the federal government has forced us to live under its rule and seemingly foreclosed our ability to imagine other possibilities outside of our fixed 11 county area, it has not foreclosed all of our possibilities. It may be difficult to see how this relates to the subject of Lindsay Schneider's essay, which is about both the 200 foot high concrete and steel Dalles Dam, the Dalles Dam, constructed in 1957 on the Columbia River, which divides Oregon and Washington, and Celilo Falls, also called Wyam, which it flooded and seemingly destroyed. 
Celaya Falls is remembered and grieved over today as a fishing site gathering place and one of the oldest places to be continually inhabited by humans on the continent. It is a place of exceptional importance um, in the Pacific Northwest for indigenous people, a sacred place. It's, it's hard to really overstate that. Schneider's essay addresses gender and property in the Columbia River Basin arguing, these are her words, that masculine forms of labor associated the transformation of the landscape through homesteading and dam construction were not incidental, but rather a key part of how settler colonialism relies on the logic of heteropatriarchy. Yet that's not the only or the final story of the falls or the river, she writes. Instead, she details the ways in which the river archives the failure of settler colonialism to erase or subsume indigenous land relationships. Calling the Columbia River an archive, Schneider eliminates a still living relationship with the falls that persists beyond the environmental and social violence inflicted on it. The dam was and is catastrophic for indigenous peoples in our region, but it did not end their relationship with the falls. More than a physical place, it's a place continually sustained through memory, story, and ongoing relationships with more than human kin, such as the imperiled salmon that are still fished in the river. She concludes by saying, it is only through the restoration and flourishing of the complex web of indigenous relationships with land, water, and our more than human kin that we can hope to recover from the damage that settler colonial notions of land as property with all their attendant conceptions of gender, heteropatriarchy, and domination have done to the land and to indigenous peoples. Amid the urgency of environmental devastation in the U.S. West and its imperiled rivers, Schneider's essay rings and sings with indigenous futurity and in doing so offers a healing vision of the wounded West. There's a future for Slilo Falls, she argues, beyond the seeming permanence of this dam and the ideas that made the dam in the first place. In her call and call out to women historians of the American West at their first conference in 1983, Suzanne Harjo urged them to ask themselves, do my motivations influence my methodologies? Through the framework of indigenous futurity, I sense the possibilities of old, new, past, present, future methodologies as I seek a shared lexicon for how to care for a region beset by the differentiated histories of environmental, racial, and social injustice by impacts of ruinous, extractive economies of settler closing. I took that picture. Uh, you can see the fires, right, in the, in the summer. Um, with the long, unimaginable undamming of the Klamath River set to start in 2023, the river of the Salmon peoples in Oregon and California, including the Kuduk tribe, a river that's been on the brink of environmental collapse for years, we see that transformative, restorative world making can happen. When we remember into the future, we carry our histories, reckonings, hopes, and creativity. We imagine and remember forward, creating new stories of gender in the American West and really the whole damn thing. And I wanted to close, ooh, where'd it go? There we go. With a quote from James Welch, I was so fortunate to join Nancy Cook in July to uh, be part of an honoring of the late great native writer, James Welch, whose words from a collection of poetry, Writing the Earth Boy 40, I think underscores what's at stake always when we're talking about the American West. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Susan. But, um, that was a lot of things uh, you made me at least think about. So um, I'm going to ask people uh, if they want to share some thoughts, ask some questions, or start a conversation with Susan, whom I'm sure will be delighted to answer. Thank you, Susan, for that really, really wonderful talk that took us to so many different places. And I'm so inspired by the ending and the mention, your description of that last chapter. And I was thinking, um, you know, to, to your original question about how do we bridge these two fields of, you know, Western American studies that usually pertains to whiteness and indigenous studies. And I think temporality is one way to think about that bridge as you know, as my talk yesterday was kind of trying to gesture at, but 
it suddenly occurred to me that we talk about so much of the, uh, the devastating effects of settler colonialism on indigenous peoples, but I was thinking also about the much more, to my mind at least, culturally, psychologically healthy approach to time that, that she's describing in her chapter um, of bringing the past into the future than obtains in the settler ideology, which we, we think of as what happens when it gets west, right? All that destruction. Mm -hmm. But think about Joan Didion's description of that settler ideology in her essays like Sachin Towards Bethlehem, and that, that somehow white people thought you could just end the past, right? You break from it in moving west. And, and that that is central to the whole Turnerian ideology of the West that, you know, frontier is over. That notion of the past being left behind is so destructive and not just for the indigenous people who have to suffer this presence of people that think they can rewrite the landscape in their own image. Um, is the, do you think that's a productive way to think about this? Uh, I, I really... I think there's so much, I really appreciated your talk yesterday about, about time and I was already knowing that I'd want to have a conversation with you because I'm just starting to think about this a bit more. You know, I think that, um, I think the pandemic, you know, it made things clearer, I think in some ways, right? About like just kind of getting to it, getting to the work and kind of trying to figure things out a bit more. And I think um, at least in the Pacific Northwest, um, the climate catastrophe and the wildfires is so serious, the droughts. I mean, it's just, it's right here. The future, future's right here. And it, it really is this question of what is going to shift the ways of thinking that created these problems in the first place. And the connective tissue I've certainly seen um, examples of Northwestern California for sure, are new partnerships between tribal communities um, and government agencies. And um, the undamming of the Klamath is happening because of an extraordinary collaboration of um, indigenous and non-indigenous communities, fishers, you know, uh, environmental activists, not, not the ranchers so much. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. Um, but I think that's where, and what is, and so that is a bit of a challenge when you're, when you're thinking of always moving, right? And that kind of, you leave it behind. I mean, this has kind of been our MO in the country. Ah, we screw this up. We keep going. I mean, the West Coast presents this very stark challenge. Well, wait, there's nowhere else to go. What does it mean to kind of deal with, deal with where we are? Not really answering your question as much as to say that I do think, I, I've seen that the ways of rethinking, um, you were talking about this a few days ago, Neil, or was it yesterday? Uh, the ethics of care, I think, is something that is a really important framework for me. It's, of course, very central to feminist, um, you know, feminist practice as well, it's, uh, but it, it matters. So I, I'm, I am looking for those connective tissues. Um, and, uh, you know, reality is so much messier than we often think. That's why I wanted to mention, you know, my work in, in the Land of the Grasshopper song, because, you know, it's, it's very easy to demonize those two women um, from the outside, and you just don't know the, 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 the nuances and the realities when humans are with each other, communicating in relationships. And that's probably where we're going to need to be is doing that local, local work. Neil? Um, <laughs> loved it, loved it. Um, okay. <laughs> you just used a phrase which I thought was actually going through my head, you know, and obviously the way you were talking about the construction and the structuring and, and rethinking the book, the connecting tissues and how we connect tissues. And, uh, and I love the idea that you had your four key words, but then the fifth one. Because to me, that said it all. The idea of the archive and what the archive traditionally means, that's a whole conference there, right? You know. Yes. Um, but it, then it made me think about connecting tissues, about moving forward, about travel, 
about the connections between gender, borders, Native American culture, and Valeria Luiselli's book, Lost Children Archive, which, if you haven't read it, I in have my not. view, is one of the most important novels oh. of the 21st century. It addresses so many of these issues. Uh, it's a stunning examination of the notion of the archive and what we do with it, and how we abuse it, and how we can actually create an archive, I think in your terms, for the future. Yeah. It's what Derrida says. Derrida says the archive is about the future. It's not really about the past. It should never be about the past. It's about what you do with that material. Um, and I don't know, again, I'm just, sorry, this is just me rambling, but there's a British, a British uh, feminist uh, writer called Caroline Steadman, Steedman, and she's written a whole series of wonderful books about archiving. And one of them is just called Dust. And it, it says it all to me, the idea that so many archives are just dust. And people go in these dusty archives and fiddle with the past, but they don't then connect it looking forward. And it just seemed to me that, for me, ah, that was great. Loved it. Oh, th thank, thank you. And thank you for that. Luce, uh, Susan Colleen writes about uh, Lucy, Lucy. Lucy. Lucelli in, in the chapter for the book. Thank you for those recommendations. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, I think she's Cree. I just can't think of her name, Ricolet. Um, she, she's an indigenous uh, artist. She, ref, she has a, she has a term futurity bundle. It's like medicine bundle, but it's your futurity bundle. It's the med, it's like a way of thinking about the medicines you need to take with you. I have found it a very, I'm very excited about this. Laura Harjo's book is a revelation. I highly recommend it. It's absolutely extraordinary. It's a tour de force book. Um, and it, to, it, it's me thinking about, how, it gives me some hope that, that we can kind of figure out ways, you know, to kind of braid our knowledges and our experiences. It's not about demonizing one group or the other. That's, that's a complete waste of time. It's really just thinking about how we can generate these new knowledges, you know, in conversation and together. So thank you. Can I share a thought I have? Uh, when you talk, especially in part one, okay, like we're talking about, um, uh, Bill just talked about ending the past. Uh, you talked about uh, Columbus Day, and it just brought to my mind Next week, we celebrate Columbus Day in Spain on the 12th of October, which for everyone is a fun day because it's a holiday. This year is a Wednesday, so we just have one day off. If it had been a Tuesday, we would have a whole long weekend off, okay? But it's interesting how we not only end, ended the past, but we celebrate it because we are celebrating the dispossession of the indigenous people who are coming back to Spain now. This, this, Thousands of um, migrants from South America come to Spain, just um, doing the the let's say the the hardest jobs. Like women are uh, uh, care, they, they take care of old people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's interesting that we not only forget the archive, but we manipulate it in a way. Okay, no one in Spain has, I mean, like as a country, thinks about uh, what happened in what they call the Americas. Okay, mm -hmm. So what we celebrate next week is the Dia de la Hispanidad, okay, mm -hmm. the day of these Americas, uh, all arising from our mother um, country, which is Spain. Okay, There's also uh, a great debate in Spain about uh, la memoria, we call it, because today in Spain, there are thousands of people who are buried in common, how to call them, in fosas comunes, in, in in, how do you call, how do you, how do you say, una fosa comuna? Graves, no. Like graves, but like um, without a name, you know, just like dumped there, okay? Um, as a result of Franco's regime, only, oh. only 50 years ago, okay? And there's a strong um, um, need of people are demanding that, that the memory of those people, mm -hmm. that those caves are opened and, and, and the bones are um, identified mm -hmm. and, and given names, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Okay, so it is interesting how uh, you, at least in the US, are thinking about memory and how you have um, used the archives. Or, But here in Spain, we are 
as I say, celebrating the discovery of America and also forgetting about people who are buried in any, any road there, okay? So, so um, I guess you are thousands of thinking ahead what we are here, okay? <laughs> Which the is, United States, are you, uh, that's uh, funny. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting to <laughs> say that, yeah. Well, I, I, wow, that's, I didn't know that you, I didn't know that you celebrated Columbus Day. Yeah. That's, really? 12th of October, next Wednesday. <laughs> That's supposedly the day <coughs> that they got, they discovered America, yeah. There's a great phrase we use in indigenous studies called Columbusing. You know, like, I'm the first person who discovered this. <laughs> no, you're not. Um, it's, you know, it's uneven. It, it, it's uneven, but it, it has been, I, I moved from New York State to Oregon five years ago, and New York is really into Columbus Day right in new york city and it's like it is i don't know if i don't think it's i mean I, yeah it's it because columbus is really you know revered and by or you know it's and there's you know still a bunch of columbus statues came down there was a great newspaper headline in 2020 uh from from boston and it was said uh, it was like there was crime scene tape around the Columbus statue and he was beheaded. <laughs> I was just, sorry, it was kind of funny. <laughs> but I mean, I think those are, I mean, I certainly are, are, the reckonings in the United States are extremely fraught. We're not anywhere where Canada and where Canada has been with their truth and reconciliation, although heavily criticized in Canada. But from my vantage point, from our, I, Canada is so far ahead of, I mean, Hmm? So I can say just, from the, from the Spanish perspective, you are way ahead. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about the, the boarding schools, I feel like it is kind of extraordinary as, as all of these really difficult things have happened. And I think kind of, we were talking about this the other day. I mean, in Trump's America, I mean, it was kind of the joke at, at a friend at Standing Rock. And he said, yeah, what do you think? What do you think uh, we Native people have been dealing with for the last couple of years? Now now you get to see what it's like. And I was like, oh, point taken. Um, but the fact that at the same time we've had these extraordinary shifts, having um, Deb Holland, I mean, just really historic moments for us as a country to have Native Americans in these leadership positions really matters. I mean, I'm, I'm very much at the ground level and in and, and leadership positions around um, um, creating space at the university for indigenous students, hiring indigenous faculty, it makes such a difference. And it is it is awesome to behold when it happens. And so we do have a whole Indigenous Peoples Day on, well, I guess I gotta get back for it, but yeah, on Monday. So there's there's awesome stuff happening. The boarding, you know, we, we haven't had any really national reckoning with the boarding schools. Deb Holland is the one initiating that conversation in the United States. It's a, it's, it's a pretty big deal. I think most Americans know nothing about the Indian boarding schools. I mean, it's not, not nothing is taught in our schools. In fourth grade, you do a little thing around Thanksgiving and like a social studies project on, depending on what region of the United States you're in. So, you know, in California, it's like popsicle sticks and California missions. And so that's all still happening. Very short, whoops very short question related to what Amaya was saying. Uh, you were showing the pictures of the pioneer, pioneer mother <laughs> yeah. being toppled. Has anything been placed in those spaces instead of the, I mean, is that past being revised somehow? Oh, that's such a great, I, 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 I may know the perpetrator. <laughs> I remain anonymous, however. <laughs> oh. um, no, they, um, the, they were removed and they were removed to an undisclosed location and they are empty. At least I was, I was there um, in the fall, I think. I went, I went to look for them because I was, I was really curious um, about how they were engaging it. Um, so for now that, for now they are just, uh, unless it's it's been updated, just kind of the empty space, which I think is also kind of imbued with meaning. 
there had been previous actions with, uh, uh, you know, with spray paint. There was a lot of frustration that these, um, and there's a there's particularly particular histories around both the sculpture and the the dedication and, and actually the 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 speech that Donald Trump gave um, at Mount Rushmore on July fourth, twenty twenty. It's virtually identical to the speech that was given at the dedication of the Pioneer sculpture. So it was just like, to me, part of where I was thinking with this is, um, you know, if you've read uh, Octavia Butler's novel Kindred, and she's flung back from, you know, modern day LA to slavery, and she is an enslaved human. And that this is feeling with Donald Trump is like, they we're getting Hold, we're getting yanked back to this really horrible, like the, only the worst parts of, of our Western past and just really trying to like, like push against that. I think um, it got a lot of attention. Um, I do spend quite a bit of time in my introduction talking about it with a lot of footnotes um, and all the folks in Native Studies at University of Oregon, um, Kirby Brown, who's a, a probably well-known Western Literature Association members, been really involved in that as well, um, to really try to force a, a, a public conversation about it. I think the conversation is important. It, 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 the, the other thing that's happening right now, um, um, a colleague of mine, David Lewis, who's Kalapuyan, first Kalapuyan tenure track faculty at Oregon State, so it's pretty awesome. But he's really engaged in um, efforts in Lane County where University of Oregon is to do some um, name changes and things like that. So he, he's been having those community conversations, which I think are really, again, back to what we were saying earlier, really important, um, I think, uh, community building efforts a across difference uh, to really talk about the past in a way that's meant to be healing and not meant to be condemnatory. Can we get one more question and then we, I guess we need to. It's <laughs> actually, I don't have a question, I have an observation. I hope this is appropriate. Sure. Um, I'm struck by the concluding message, the one of the staying positive, of the, 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 uh, the making the, the connective tissue and finding ways to bridge gaps and then do so moving into the future. I was just struck by the fact that the, the logo behind you is my understanding is that's representative of the gathering tree in Guernica. And I think if my Google translating app is accurate, that that slogan above it is about giving and, and spreading knowledge and, and uh, connections. So, oh, wow. so your message resonates with the wall behind you. That's beautiful. <laughs> Let me... Uh Thank, Thank you. Let me see. Let me uh, tell me if I'm wrong. This is um, the symbol of the University of Basque Country, okay? And it was. It, um, my understanding is it's a symbol of Basque Country. It's all over. It is. Yeah. It's it all was, over the soccer stadium that's in Bilbao, for it example. It was designed by Eduardo Chillida, who's one of the main um, like Basque. Um, 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 how do you say? Uh, sculptures. Um, I really recommend you visit. If you've got a couple of days, you, you visit the his museum in next to San Sebastian. It really is worth watching, seeing. And if you got a San Sebastian, there's also a very nice sculpture, like right where the sea ends. And um, it symbolizes not only that, but also the Basque country. Like the Basque country has this shape. Okay, and what else? The tree of knowledge. Okay, and as you were saying, the logo. What? Okay, that's, that's kind of the way he, he, he worked. Okay, very iron, meaning, I mean, the Basque country has always been um, uh, famous for its iron production. Okay, like, and it also, this is a little too mythical, but the strength and the iron, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but uh, and again, as you say, Manta Sabal Sasu uh, means give and, give and share, okay? Which is supposedly the, the motto of this university. So absolutely. That's, it is, I've been admiring, but I didn't know what it meant. What you it should mean. check Chiyida's work. It really is worth, uh, uh, and then if you can go to the place, which is in, what town is it exactly? Usurville? Which? Ten minutes. Yeah, sure. Bye. <laughs> thank you all for um, listening to Susan. Thank, thank you, you, Susan, for this great talk. Thanks. Thank